Wahhabism Arabic, al al -H, is an Islamic doctrine and religious Salafi movement founded by Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab. It has been variously described as ultraconservative, austere, fundamentalist, or Puritan ICAL as an Islamic reform movement to restore pure monotheistic worship tawhid by devotees, and as a deviant sectarian movement, vile sect, and a distortion of Islam by its opponents. The term Wahhabi -ism is often used polemically and adherents commonly reject its use, preferring to be called Salafi or Mawahid, claiming to emphasize the principle of tawhid the uniqueness and unity of God, for exclusivity on monotheism, dismissing other Muslims as practicing shirk, idolatry. It follows the theology of Ibn Taymiyyah and the Hanbali school of jurisprudence. Although Hanbali leaders renounced Abd al Wahhab's views, Wahhabism is named after an 18th century preacher and activist, Muhammad ibn Abd al Wahhab. He started a reform movement in the remote, sparsely populated region of Najd, advocating a purging of such widespread Sunni practices as the veneration of saints and the visiting of their tombs and shrines, that were practiced all over the Islamic world, but which he considered idolatrous impurities and innovations in Islam .Eventually he formed a pact with a local leader, Muhammad bin Saud, offering political obedience and promising that protection and propagation of the Wahhabi movement meant, power and glory, and rule of lands and men. The alliance between followers of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab and Muhammad bin Saud's successors the House of Saud proved to be a durable one. The House of Saud continued to maintain its politico-religious alliance with the Wahhabi sect through the waxing and waning of its own political fortunes over the next 150 years, through to its eventual proclamation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932, and then afterwards, on into modern times. Today Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's teachings are the official, state-sponsored form of Sunni Islam in Saudi Arabia. With the help of funding from Saudi petroleum exports and other factors, the movement underwent explosive growth, beginning in the 1970s and now has worldwide influence. The U.S. State Department has estimated that over the past four decades the capital Riyadh has invested more than $10 billion, $6 billion pounds into charitable foundations in an attempt to replace mainstream Sunni Islam with the harsh intolerance of Wahhabism, as of 2017 changes to Saudi religious policy by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman have led some to suggest that, "...Islamists throughout the world will have to follow suit or risk winding up on the wrong side of orthodoxy." The «boundaries» of Wahhabism have been called «difficult to pinpoint», but in contemporary usage, the terms Wahhabi and Salafi are often used interchangeably, and they are considered to be movements with different roots that have merged since the 1960s. However, Wahhabism has also been called «a particular orientation within Salafism» or an ultra-conservative, Saudi brand of Salafism. Estimates of the number of adherents to Wahhabism vary, with one source Merdad Izzidi giving a figure of fewer than 5 million Wahhabis in the Persian Gulf region compared to 28.5 million Sunnis and 89 million Shia. The majority of Sunni and Shia Muslims worldwide disagree with the interpretation of Wahhabism, and many Muslims denounce them as a faction or a vile sect. Islamic scholars, including those from the Al Azhar University, regularly denounce Wahhabism with terms such as satanic faith. Wahhabism has been accused of being a source of global terrorism, inspiring the ideology of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant ISIL, and for causing disunity in Muslim communities by labeling Muslims who disagreed with the Wahhabi definition of monotheism as apostates and justifying their killing. It has also been criticized for the destruction of historic shrines of saints, mausoleums, and other Muslim and non-Muslim buildings and artifacts. Topic. Definitions and etymology Topic. Definitions Some definitions or uses of the term Wahhabi Islam include a corpus of doctrines and a set of attitudes and behavior, derived from the teachings of a particularly severe religious reformist who lived in Central Arabia in the mid-18th century." Giles Keppel. P. 
pure Islam. David Commons, paraphrasing supporters' definition, that does not deviate from Sharia law in any way and should be called Islam and not Wahhabism, King Salman bin Abdul Aziz, King of Saudi Arabia. A misguided creed that fosters intolerance, promotes simplistic theology, and restricts Islam's capacity for adaption to diverse and shifting circumstances. David Commons, paraphrasing opponents' definition. A conservative reform movement. The creed upon which the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was founded, and which has influenced Islamic movements worldwide. Encyclopedia of Islam and the Muslim World. A sect dominant in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, with footholds in India, Africa, and elsewhere, with a steadfastly fundamentalist interpretation of Islam in the tradition of Ibn Hanbal, Cyril Glass, an 18th century reformist, revivalist movement for sociomoral reconstruction of society, founded by Muhammad ibn Abd al Wahhab, Oxford Dictionary of Islam. Originally a literal revivification of Islamic principles that ignored the spiritual side of Islam, that rose on the wings of enthusiasm and longing and then sank down into the lowlands of Pharisaic self righteousness. After gaining power and losing its longing and humility, Muhammad Asad, a political trend within Islam that has been adopted for power sharing purposes, but cannot be called a sect because it has no special practices, nor special rites, and no special interpretation of religion that differ from the main body of Sunni Islam." Abdallah al-Obaid, the former dean of the Islamic University of Medina and member of the Saudi Consultative Council. The true Salafist movement. Starting out as a theological reform movement, it had the goal of calling dawah people to restore the real meaning of tawhid oneness of god or monotheism and to disregard and deconstruct traditional disciplines and practices that evolved in islamic history such as theology and jurisprudence and the traditions of visiting tombs and shrines of venerated individuals ahmad musali a term used by opponents of salafism in hopes of besmirching that movement by suggesting foreign influence and conjuring up images of Saudi Arabia. The term is, "...most frequently used in countries where Salafis are a small minority," of the Muslim community but, "...have made recent inroads," in, "...converting," the local population to Salafism. Quintin Wiktorovich A blanket term used inaccurately to refer to any Islamic movement that has an apparent tendency toward misogyny, militantism, extremism, or strict and literal interpretation of the Quran and Hadith. Natana J. DeLong Ba. Etymology <inaudible> 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 According to Saudi writer Abdul Aziz Qasim and others, it was the Ottomans who first labeled Abdul Wahhab's school of Islam in Saudi Arabia as Wahhabism. The British also adopted it and expanded its use in the Middle East. Topic: <laughs> Naming controversy, Wahhabis, Mawahidin, and Salafis. Wahhabis do not like, or at least did not like, the term. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab was averse to the elevation of scholars and other individuals, including using a person's name to label an Islamic school, according to Robert Lacey. The Wahhabis have always disliked the name customarily given to them, and preferred to be called Mawahidin Unitarians. Another preferred term was simply, Muslims, since their creed is, pure Islam. However, critics complain these terms imply non-Wahhabis are not monotheists or Muslims. Additionally, the terms Mawahidin and Unitarians are associated with other sects, both extant and extinct. Other terms Wahhabis have been said to use and or prefer include Al Al Hadith, People of Hadith, Salafi Dawa or Al Dawa Ila Al Tahid, Salafi preaching, or preaching of monotheism, for the school rather than the adherents, or Al Al Sunnah Wal Jama'a. People of the tradition of Muhammad and the consensus of the Ummah. Al al Sunnah, people of the Sunnah, or the Reform or Salafi movement of the Sheikh, the Sheikh being Ibn Abdul Wahhab. 
Early Salafis referred to themselves simply as Muslims, believing the neighboring Ottoman Caliphate was al dala al Kufriya, a heretical nation, and itself professed Muslim inhabitants actually non Muslim. The self designation as people of the Sunnah was important for Wahhabism's authenticity, because during the Ottoman period only Sunnism was the legitimate doctrine. Many, such as writer Quintin Wiktorovich, urge use of the term Salafi, maintaining that one would be hard-pressed to find individuals who refer to themselves as Wahhabis or organizations that use Wahhabi in their title, or refer to their ideology in this manner, unless they are speaking to a Western audience that is unfamiliar with Islamic terminology, and even then usage is limited and often appears as Salafi, Wahhabi." A New York Times journalist writes that Saudis abhor the term Wahhabism feeling it sets them apart and contradicts the notion that Islam is a monolithic faith." Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz al Saud for example has attacked the term as, "...a doctrine that doesn't exist here Saudi Arabia," and challenged users of the term to locate any, "...deviance of the form of Islam practiced in Saudi Arabia from the teachings of the Quran and prophetic hadiths." Ingrid Matson argues that, "...wabism is not a sect." It is a social movement that began 200 years ago to rid Islam of rigid cultural practices that had been acquired over the centuries. On the other hand, according to authors at Global Security and Library of Congress, the term is now commonplace and used even by Wahhabi scholars in the NAJD, a region often called the heartland of Wahhabism. Journalist Karen House calls Salafi a more politically correct term. For Wahhabi, in any case, according to Lacey, none of the other terms have caught on, and so like the Christian Quakers, Wahhabis have "...remained known by the name first assigned to them by their detractors." <laughs> <laughs> Wahhabis and Salafis Many scholars and critics distinguish between Wahhabi and Salafi. According to American scholar Christopher M. Blanchard, Wahhabism refers to a conservative Islamic creed centered in and emanating from Saudi Arabia, while Salafia is a more general puritanical Islamic movement that has developed independently at various times and in various places in the Islamic world. However, many call Wahhabism a more strict, Saudi form of Salafi. Wahhabism is the Saudi version of Salafism, according to Mark Dury, who states Saudi leaders are active and diligent in using their considerable financial resources in funding and promoting Salafism all around the world. Ahmad Musali tends to agree Wahhabism is a subset of Salafism, saying, As a rule, all Wahhabis are Salafists, but not all Salafists are Wahhabis. Hamid Alger lists three elements. Wahhabism and Salafism had in common above all disdain for all developments subsequent to al-Salaf al-Salah the first two or three generations of Islam the rejection of Sufism and the abandonment of consistent adherence to one of the four or five Sunni madhabs schools of fiqh and two important and interrelated features that distinguished Salafis from the Wahhabis a reliance on attempts at persuasion rather than coercion in order to rally other Muslims to their cause, and an informed awareness of the political and socio economic crises confronting the Muslim world. Hamid Alger and another critic, Khalid Abu el Fadl, argue Saudi oil export funding co opted the symbolism and language of Salafism during the 1960s and 70s, making them practically indistinguishable by the 1970s, and now the two ideologies have melded. Abu Lfadl believes Wahhabism rebranded itself as Salafism knowing it could not spread in the modern Muslim world as Wahhabism. History The Wahhabi mission started as a revivalist movement in the remote, arid region of Najd. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, the Al Saud dynasty, and with it Wahhabism, spread to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. After the discovery of petroleum near the Persian Gulf in 1939, it had access to oil export revenues, revenue that grew to billions of dollars. 
This money, spent on books, media, schools, universities, mosques, scholarships, fellowships, lucrative jobs for journalists, academics and Islamic scholars, gave Wahhabism a preeminent position of strength in Islam around the world, in the country of Wahhabism's founding, and by far the largest and most powerful country where it is the state religion, Wahhabi ulama gained control over education, law, public morality and religious institutions in the 20th century, while permitting as a trade-off. Doctrinally objectionable actions such as the import of modern technology and communications, and dealings with non-Muslims, for the sake of the consolidation of the power of its political guardian, the Al Saud dynasty. However, in the last couple of decades of the 20th century, several crises worked to erode Wahhabi credibility. In Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Muslim world, the November 1979 seizure of the Grand Mosque by militants, the deployment of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia during the 1991 Gulf War against Iraq, and the 9-11-2001 Al-Qaeda attacks on New York and Washington, in each case the Wahhabi establishment was called on to support the dynasty's efforts to suppress religious dissent, and in each case it did, exposing its dependence on the Saudi dynasty and its often unpopular policies. In the West, the end of the Cold War war and the anti-communist alliance with conservative, religious Saudi Arabia, and the 9-11 attacks created enormous distrust towards the kingdom and especially its official religion. <laughs> Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab The founder of Wahhabism, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, was born around 1702–03 in the small oasis town of Uyana in the Najd region, in what is now central Saudi Arabia. He studied in Basra, in what is now Iraq, and possibly Mecca and Medina while there to perform Hajj, before returning to his home town of Uyana in 1740. There he worked to spread the call Dawah for what he believed was a restoration of true monotheistic worship Tawhid, the pivotal idea. Of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's teaching was that people who called themselves Muslims but who participated in alleged innovations were not just misguided or committing a sin, but were outside the pale of Islam altogether, as were Muslims who disagreed with his definition. This included not just lax, unlettered, nomadic Bedou, but also Shias and Sunnis such as the Ottomans. Such infidels were not to be killed outright, but to be given a chance to repent first. With the support of the ruler of the town, Uthman ibn Muammar, he carried out some of his religious reforms in Uyana, including the demolition of the tomb of Zayd ibn al-Khattab, one of the Sahaba companions of the Prophet Muhammad, and the stoning to death of an adulterous woman. However, a more powerful chief Sulayman ibn Muhammad ibn Gurair pressured Uthman ibn Muammar to expel him from Uyana. Alliance with the House of Saud The ruler of a nearby town, Muhammad ibn Saud, invited ibn Abd al-Wahhab to join him, and in 1744 a pact was made between the two. Ibn Saud would protect and propagate the doctrines of the Wahhabi mission, while ibn Abdul Wahhab would support the ruler, supplying him with glory and power. Whoever championed his message, ibn Abdul Wahhab promised will, by means of it, rule the lands and men." Ibn Saud would abandon un-Sharia taxation of local harvests, and in return God might compensate him with booty from conquest and Sharia-compliant taxes that would exceed what he gave up. The alliance between the Wahhabi mission and al-Saud family has "...endured for more than two and a half centuries," surviving defeat and collapse. The two families have intermarried multiple times over the years and in today's Saudi Arabia, the minister of religion is always a member of the Al-Ash Sheikh family, i.e., a descendant of Ibn Abdul Wahhab. According to most sources, Ibn Abd al-Wahhab declared jihad against neighboring tribes, whose practices of asking saints for their intercession, making pilgrimages to tombs and special mosques, he believed to be the work of idolaters, unbelievers, one academic disputes this. According to Natana de Long Ba, Ibn Abd al-Wahhab was restrained in urging fighting with perceived unbelievers, preferring to preach and persuade rather than attack. It was only after the death of Muhammad bin Saud in 1765 that, according to de Long Ba, Muhammad bin Saud's son and successor, Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad, used a convert or die 
approached to expand his domain, and when Wahhabis adopted the takfir ideas of Ibn Taymiyyah. However, various scholars, including Simon Ross Valentine, have strongly rejected such a view of Wahhab, arguing that the image of Abdul Wahhab presented by Delong Ba is to be seen for what it is, namely a rewriting of history that flies in the face of historical fact. Conquest expanded through the Arabian Peninsula until it conquered Mecca and Medina in the early 19th century. It was at this time, according to Delong Ba, that Wahhabis embraced the ideas of Ibn Taymiyyah, which allow self professed Muslims who do not follow Islamic law to be declared non Muslims, to justify their warring and conquering the Muslim Sharifs of Hiyas. One of their most noteworthy and controversial attacks was on Karbala in 1802. There, according to a Wahhabi chronicler, Uthman b. Abdullah b. Bishr, the Muslims, as the Wahhabis referred to themselves, not feeling the need to distinguish themselves from other Muslims, since they did not believe them to be Muslims, scaled the walls, entered the city, and killed the majority of its people in the markets and in their homes. They destroyed the dome placed over the grave of al Husayn and took whatever they found inside the dome and its surroundings. The grill surrounding the tomb which was encrusted with emeralds, rubies, and other jewels. Different types of property, weapons, clothing, carpets, gold, silver, precious copies of the Quran. After this, the Wahhabis also massacred the male population and enslaved the women and children of the predominantly Sunni city of Taif in Hejaz in 1803. Saud bin Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad bin Saud managed to establish his rule over southeastern Syria between 1803 and 1812. However, Egyptian forces acting under the Ottoman Empire and led by Ibrahim Pasha were eventually successful in counterattacking in a campaign starting from 1811. In 1818 they defeated Al Saud, leveling the capital Diriyah, executing the Al Saud emir and exiling the emirate's political and religious leadership, and otherwise unsuccessfully attempted to stamp out not just the House of Saud but the Wahhabi mission as well. A second, smaller Saudi state emirate of Nejd lasted from 1819 to 1891. Its borders being within Najd, Wahhabism was protected from further Ottoman or Egyptian campaigns by the Najdi's isolation, lack of valuable resources, and that era's limited communication and transportation. By the 1880s, at least among townsmen if not Bedouin, Wahhabi strict monotheistic doctrine had become the native religious culture of the Najd. <laughs> Abdul Aziz ibn Saud In 1901, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, a fifth-generation descendant of Muhammad ibn Saud, began a military campaign that led to the conquest of much of the Arabian Peninsula and the founding of present-day Saudi Arabia. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the result that safeguarded the vision of Islam based on the tenets of Islam as preached by Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab was not bloodless, as 40,000 public executions and 350,000 amputations were carried out during its course, according to some estimates. Estimates, under the reign of Abdul Aziz, political considerations trumped religious idealism, favored by pious Wahhabis. His political and military success gave the Wahhabi ulama control over religious institutions with jurisdiction over considerable territory, and in later years Wahhabi ideas formed the basis of the rules and laws concerning social affairs, and shaped the kingdom's judicial and educational policies. But protests from Wahhabi ulama were overridden when it came to consolidating power in Hiyas and al Hasa, avoiding clashes with the great power of the region, Britain, adopting modern technology, establishing a simple governmental administrative framework, or signing an oil concession with the U.S. The Wahhabi ulama also issued a fatwa affirming that, only the ruler could declare a jihad, a violation of Ibn Abd al Wahhab's teaching, according to Delong Ba. As the realm of Wahhabism expanded under Ibn Saud into areas of Shiite al -Hasa, conquered in 1913 and pluralistic Muslim tradition Hejaz, conquered in 1924-25, Wahhabis pressed for forced conversion of Shia and an eradication of what they saw as idolatry. Ibn Saud sought a more relaxed approach. In al hasa efforts to stop the observance of Shia religious holidays and replace teaching and preaching duties of Shia clerics with Wahhabi, lasted only a year. In Mecca and Jeddah in Hejaz, prohibition of tobacco, alcohol, playing cards and listening to music on the phonograph was looser than in Najd. 
Over the objections of Wahhabi ulama, Ibn Saud permitted both the driving of automobiles and the attendance of Shia at Hajj, enforcement of the commanding right and forbidding wrong, such as enforcing prayer observance and separation of the sexes, developed a prominent place during the Second Saudi Emirate, and in 1926 a formal committee for enforcement was founded in Mecca. While Wahhabi warriors swore loyalty to monarchs of al Saud, there was one major rebellion. King Abdul Aziz put down rebelling Ikhwan, nomadic tribesmen turned Wahhabi warriors who opposed his "...introducing such innovations as telephones, automobiles, and the telegraph," and his "...sending his son to a country of unbelievers Egypt." Britain had aided Abdul Aziz, and when the Ikhwan attacked the British protectorates of Transjordan, Iraq and Kuwait, as a continuation of jihad to expand the Wahhabist realm, Abdul Aziz struck, killing hundreds before the rebels surrendered in 1929. <laughs> <laughs> Connection with the outside Before Abdul Aziz, during most of the second half of the 19th century, there was a strong aversion in Wahhabi lands to mixing with idolaters, which included most of the Muslim world. Voluntary contact was considered by Wahhabi clerics to be at least a sin, and if one enjoyed the company of idolaters, and approved of their religion, an act of unbelief, travel outside the pale of Najd to the Ottoman lands, was tightly controlled, if not prohibited altogether. Over the course of its history, however, Wahhabism has become more accommodating towards the outside world. In the late 1800s, Wahhabis found Muslims with at least similar beliefs, first with al i Hadith in India, and later with Islamic revivalists in Arab states one being Mahmud Sahiri al-Alusi in Baghdad. The revivalists and Wahhabis shared a common interest in Ibn Taymiyyah's thought, the permissibility of ijihad, and the need to purify worship practices of innovation. In the 1920s, Rashid Raida, a pioneer Salafist whose periodical al Manar was widely read in the Muslim world, published an anthology of Wahhabi treatises and a work praising the Ibn Saud as the savior of the Haramain the two holy cities, and a practitioner of authentic Islamic rule. In a bid to join the Muslim mainstream and to erase the reputation of extreme sectarianism associated with the Ikhwan. In 1926 Ibn Saud convened a Muslim Congress of representatives of Muslim governments and popular associations. By the early 1950s, the pressures on Ibn Saud of controlling the regions of Hejaz and al hasa outside the Wahhabi heartland, and of navigating the currents of regional politics, punctured the seal between the Wahhabi heartland and the land of idolatry. Outside, a major current in regional politics at that time was secular nationalism, which, with Gamal Abdul Nasser, was sweeping the Arab world. To combat it, Wahhabi missionary outreach worked closely with Saudi foreign policy initiatives. In May 1962, a conference in Mecca organized by Saudis discussed ways to combat secularism and socialism. In its wake, the World Muslim League was established to propagate Islam and repel inimical trends and dogmas. The League opened branch offices around the globe. It developed closer association between Wahhabis and leading Salafis, and made common cause with the Islamic revivalist Muslim Brotherhood, al i Hadith, and the Jamaat i Islami, combating Sufism and innovative popular religious practices and rejecting the West and Western ways which were so deleterious of Muslim piety and values. Missionaries were sent to West Africa, where the League funded schools, distributed religious literature, and gave scholarships to attend Saudi religious universities. One result was the Azala Society which fought Sufism in Nigeria, Chad, Niger, and Cameroon. An event that had a great effect on Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia was the infiltration of the transnationalist revival movement. In the form of thousands of pious, Islamist Arab Muslim Brotherhood refugees from Egypt following Nasser's clampdown on the Brotherhood and also from similar nationalist clampdowns in Iraq and Syria, to help staff the new school system of the largely illiterate kingdom, the Brotherhood's Islamist ideology differed from the more conservative Wahhabism which preached loyal obedience to the king. The Brotherhood dealt in what one author Robert Lacey, called, change-promoting concepts like social justice and anticolonialism, and gave a radical, but still apparently safe, religious twist to the Wahhabi values Saudi students had absorbed in childhood. With the Brotherhood's 
hands-on, radical Islam. Jihad became a practical possibility today. Not just part of history, the Brethren were ordered by the Saudi clergy and government not to attempt to proselytize or otherwise get involved in religious doctrinal matters within the kingdom, but nonetheless, took control of Saudi Arabia's intellectual life by publishing books and participating in discussion circles and salons held by princes. In time they took leading roles in key governmental ministries, and had influence on education curriculum. An Islamic university in Medina created in 1961 to train, mostly non-Saudi, proselytizers to Wahhabism became a haven for Muslim brother refugees from Egypt. The brothers' ideas eventually spread throughout the kingdom and had great effect on Wahhabism, although observers differ as to whether this was by undermining it or blending with it. Topic. Growth. In the 1950s and 60s within Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabi ulama maintained their hold on religious law courts, and presided over the creation of Islamic universities and a public school system which gave students a heavy dose of religious instruction. Outside of Saudi the Wahhabi ulama became less combative toward the rest of the Muslim world. In confronting the challenge of the West, Wahhabi doctrine served well for many Muslims as a platform and gained converts beyond the peninsula. A number of reasons have been given for this success, the growth in popularity and strength of both Arab nationalism although Wahhabis opposed any form of nationalism as an ideology, Saudis were Arabs, and their enemy the Ottoman Caliphate was ethnically Turkish, and Islamic reform specifically reform by following the example of those first three generations of Muslims known as the Salaf, the destruction of the Ottoman Empire which sponsored their most effective critics, the destruction of another rival, the Khilafah in Hejaz, in 1925, not least in importance was the money Saudi Arabia earned from exporting oil. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Petroleum export era. The pumping and export of oil from Saudi Arabia started during World War II, and its earnings helped fund religious activities in the 1950s and 60s. But it was the 1973 oil crisis and quadrupling in the price of oil that both increased the kingdom's wealth astronomically and enhanced its prestige by demonstrating its international power as a leader of OPEC. By 1980, Saudi Arabia was earning every three days the income from oil it had taken a year to earn before the embargo. Tens of billions of U.S. dollars of this money were spent on books, media, schools, scholarships for students from primary to postgraduate, fellowships and subsidies to reward journalists, academics and Islamic scholars, the building of hundreds of Islamic centers and universities, and over 1,000 schools and 1,000 mosques. During this time, Wahhabism attained what Giles Keppel called a preeminent position of strength in the global expression of Islam. Afghanistan Jihad The apex of cooperation between Wahhabis and Muslim revivalist groups was the Afghan Jihad. In December 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Shortly thereafter, Abdullah Yusuf Azam, a Muslim brother cleric with ties to Saudi religious institutions, issued a fatwa declaring defensive jihad in Afghanistan against the atheist Soviet Union. Fard -ain a personal or individual obligation for all Muslims. The edict was supported by Saudi Arabia's Grand Mufti highest religious scholar, Abd al-Aziz ibn Baz, among others, between 1982 and 1992 an estimated 35,000 individual Muslim volunteers went to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets and their Afghan regime. Thousands more attended frontier schools teeming with former and future fighters. Somewhere between 12,000 and 25,000 of these volunteers came from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and the other conservative Gulf monarchies also provided considerable financial support to the jihad $600 million a year by 1982. By 1989, Soviet troops had withdrawn and within a few years the pro Soviet regime in Kabul had collapsed. This Saudi, Wahhabi religious triumph further stood out in the Muslim world because many Muslim majority states and the PLO were allied with the Soviet Union and did not support the Afghan jihad. 
but many jihad volunteers most famously Osama bin Laden returning home to Saudi Arabia and elsewhere were often radicalized by Islamic militants who were much more extreme than their Saudi sponsors. Topic: <laughs> Erosion of Wahhabism. Topic: <laughs> Islamic Revolution in Iran. The February 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran challenged Saudi Wahhabism in a number of ways on a number of fronts. It was a revolution of Shia, not Sunni. Islam and Wahhabism held that Shia were not truly Muslims. Nonetheless, its massive popularity in Iran and its overthrow of a pro-American secular monarchy generated enormous enthusiasm among pious Sunni, not just Shia Muslims around the world. Its leader Ruhollah Khomeini preached that monarchy was against Islam and America was Islam's enemy, and called for the overthrow of Al Saud family. In 1987 public address Khomeini declared that these vile and ungodly Wahhabis are like daggers which have always pierced the heart of the Muslims from the back, and announced that Mecca was in the hands of a band of heretics. All this spurred Saudi Arabia, a kingdom allied with America, to redouble their efforts to counter Iran and spread Wahhabism around the world, and reversed any moves by Saudi leaders to distance itself from Wahhabism or soften its ideology. Topic. Grand Mosque seizure In 1979, 400–500 Islamist insurgents, using smuggled weapons and supplies, took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca, called for an overthrow of the monarchy, denounced the Wahhabi ulama as royal puppets, and announced the arrival of the Mahdi of end time. The insurgents deviated from Wahhabi doctrine in significant details, but were also associated with leading Wahhabi ulama Abd al-Aziz ibn Baz knew the insurgents' leader, Juhayman al-Otabi. Their seizure of Islam's holiest site, the taking hostage of hundreds of Hajj pilgrims, and the deaths of hundreds of militants, security forces and hostages caught in crossfire during the two-week-long retaking of the mosque, all shocked the Islamic world and did not enhance the prestige of al-Saud as custodians of the mosque. The incident also damaged the prestige of the Wahhabi establishment. Saudi leadership sought and received Wahhabi fatawa to approve the military removal of the insurgents and after that to execute them, but Wahhabi clerics also fell under suspicion for involvement with the insurgents. In part as a consequence, Sawa clerics influenced by Brethren's ideas were given freer reign. Their ideology was also thought more likely to compete with the recent Islamic revolutionism, third worldism of the Iranian Revolution. Although the insurgents were motivated by religious puritanism, the incident was not followed by a crackdown on other religious purists, but by giving greater power to the ulama and religious conservatives to more strictly enforce Islamic codes in myriad ways, from the banning of women's images in the media to adding even more hours of Islamic studies in school and giving more power and money to the religious police to enforce conservative rules of behavior. Topic: 1990 Gulf War. In August 1990, Iraq invaded and annexed Kuwait. Concerned that Saddam Hussein might push south and seize its own oil fields, Saudis requested military support from the U.S. and allowed tens of thousands of U.S. troops to be based in the kingdom to fight Iraq. But what? amounted to seeking infidels' assistance against a Muslim power," was difficult to justify in terms of Wahhabi doctrine. Again Saudi authorities sought and received a fatwa from leading Wahhabi ulama supporting their action. The fatwa failed to persuade many conservative Muslims and ulama who strongly opposed U.S. presence, including the Muslim Brotherhood supported Sawa awakening movement that began pushing for political change in the kingdom. Outside the kingdom, Islamist revival groups that had long received aid from Saudi and had ties with Wahhabis Arab jihadists, Pakistani and Afghan Islamists supported Iraq, not Saudi. During this time and later, many in the Wahhabi, Salafi movement such as Osama bin Laden not only no longer looked to the Saudi monarch as an emir of Islam, but supported his overthrow, focusing on jihad against the U.S. and what they believe are other enemies of Islam. This movement is sometimes called Neo-Wahhabi or Neo-Salafi. After 
The 2001 9-11 attacks on Saudi's putative ally, the U.S., that killed almost 3,000 people and caused at least $10 billion in property and infrastructure damage, were assumed by many, at least outside the kingdom, to be an expression of Wahhabism, since the al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden and most of the 9-11 hijackers were Saudi nationals. A backlash in the formerly hospitable U.S. against the kingdom focused on its official religion that came to be considered by some a doctrine of terrorism and hate." Inside the kingdom, Crown Prince Abdullah addressed the country's religious, tribal, business and media leadership following the attacks in a series of televised gatherings calling for a strategy to correct what had gone wrong. According to Robert Lacey, the gatherings and later articles and replies by a top cleric, Abdullah Turki, and two top Al Saud princes, Prince Turki Al Faisal and Prince Talal bin Abdul Aziz, served as an occasion to sort out who had the ultimate power in the kingdom, not the ulama, but rather the Al Saud dynasty. They declared that Muslim rulers were meant to exercise power, while religious scholars were meant to advise. In 2003 04, Saudi Arabia saw a wave of al Qaeda related suicide bombings, attacks on non Muslim foreigners, about 80% of those employed in the Saudi private sector are foreign workers and constitute about 30% of the country's population, and gun battles between Saudi security forces and militants. One reaction to the attacks was a trimming back of the Wahhabi establishment's domination of religion and society. National dialogues were held that included Shiites, Sufis, liberal reformers, and professional women. In 2009, as part of what some called an effort to take on the ulama and reform the clerical establishment, King Abdullah issued a decree that only officially approved religious scholars would be allowed to issue fatwas in Saudi Arabia. The king also expanded the Council of Senior Scholars containing officially approved religious scholars to include scholars from Sunni schools of Islamic jurisprudence other than the Hanbali Madhab, Shafi'i, Hanafi and Maliki schools. Relations with the Muslim Brotherhood have deteriorated steadily. After 9-11, the then Interior Minister Prince Nayef blamed the Brotherhood for extremism in the kingdom, and he declared it guilty of betrayal of pledges and ingratitude. And the source of all problems in the Islamic world, after it was elected to power in Egypt. In March 2014 the Saudi government declared the Brotherhood a terrorist organization. In April 2016, Saudi Arabia stripped its religious police, who enforce Islamic law on the society and are known as the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, from their power to follow, chase, stop, question, verify identification, or arrest any suspected persons when carrying out duties. They were told to report suspicious behavior to regular police and anti-drug units, who would decide whether to take the matter further. <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman Bold reformist actions on religious policy taken by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in 2017 have led some to question the future of Wahhabi conservatism. In an October 2017 interview with The Guardian newspaper, MBS stated, What happened in the last 30 years is not Saudi Arabia. What happened in the region in the last 30 years is not the Middle East. After the Iranian Revolution in 1979, people wanted to copy this model in different countries, one of them is Saudi Arabia. We didn't know how to deal with it. And the problem spread all over the world. Now is the time to get rid of it. MBS has ruled in favor of allowing women to drive and enter sports stadiums, eventually reopening cinemas. According to Kamel Dowd, MBS is, above all, putting pressure on the clergy and announcing the review and certification of the great canons of Muslim orthodoxy, including the hadiths, the collection of the Prophet Muhammad's sayings. MBS pronouncements, as well as an international conference on Sunni Islam in Grozny funded by the government of the United Arab Emirates where 200 Muslim scholars from Egypt, Russia, Syria, Sudan, Jordan, and Europe reject ed Saudi Arabia's doctrine have been called a frontal assault on Wahhabism, as well as an assault on other conservative interpretations of Islam, such as Salafism and Diobandism. Topic. Memoirs of Mr. Hempfer A widely circulated but discredited apocryphal description of the founding of Wahhabism 
Known as Memoirs of Mr. Hemfer, the British spy to the Middle East other titles have been used, alleges that a British agent named Hemfer was responsible for the creation of Wahhabism. In the memoir, Hemfer corrupts Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, manipulating him to preach his new interpretation of Islam for the purpose of sowing dissension and disunity among Muslims so that we, the English people, may live in welfare and luxury. Practices As a religious revivalist movement that works to bring Muslims back from what it believes are foreign accretions that have corrupted Islam, and believes that Islam is a complete way of life and so has prescriptions for all aspects of life, Wahhabism is quite strict in what it considers Islamic behavior. As a result, it has been described as the strictest form of Sunni Islam. On the other hand critics argue, Wahhabism is not strict, but a distorted version of Islam and not based on traditional Sharia law, nor is their practice typical or mired in the roots of Islam. This does not mean however, that all adherents agree on what is required or forbidden, or that rules have not varied by area or changed over time. In Saudi Arabia the strict religious atmosphere of Wahhabi doctrine is visible in the conformity in dress, public deportment, and public prayer, and makes its presence felt by the wide freedom of action of the religious police, clerics in mosques, teachers in schools, and judges who are religious legal scholars in Saudi courts. <laughs> Commanding right and forbidding wrong Wahhabism is noted for its policy of compelling its own followers and other Muslims strictly to observe the religious duties of Islam, such as the five prayers and for enforcement of public morals to a degree not found elsewhere while other muslims might urge abstention from alcohol modest dress and salat prayer for wahhabi's prayer that is punctual ritually correct and communally performed not only as urged but publicly required of men not only is wine forbidden but so are all intoxicating drinks and other stimulants including tobacco not only is modest dress prescribed, but the type of clothing that should be worn, especially by women a black abaya, covering all but the eyes and hands is specified, following the preaching and practice of Abdul Wahhab that coercion should be used to enforce following of sharia, an official committee has been empowered to command the good and forbid the evil, the so-called religious police. In Saudi Arabia, the one country founded with the help of Wahhabi warriors and whose scholars and pious citizens dominate many aspects of the kingdom's life. Committee. Field officers. Enforce strict closing of shops at prayer time, segregation of the sexes, prohibition of the sale and consumption of alcohol, driving of motor vehicles by women, and other social restrictions. A large number of practices have been reported forbidden by Saudi Wahhabi officials, preachers or religious police. Practices that have been forbidden as bid'ah ah innovation or shirk and sometimes punished by flogging during Wahhabi history include performing or listening to music, dancing, fortune telling, amulets, television programs unless religious, smoking, playing backgammon, chess, or cards, drawing human or animal figures, acting in a play or writing fiction both are considered forms of lying, dissecting cadavers even in criminal investigations and for the purposes of medical research, recorded music played over telephones on hold or the sending of flowers to friends or relatives who are in the hospital. Common Muslim practices Wahhabis believe are contrary to Islam include listening to music in praise of Muhammad, praying to God while visiting tombs including the tomb of Muhammad, celebrating Maulid birthday of the Prophet, the use of ornamentation on or in mosques. The driving of motor vehicles by women is allowed in every country but Wahhabi dominated Saudi Arabia and dream interpretation, practiced by the famously strict Taliban, is discouraged by Wahhabis. Wahhabism emphasizes Thakafa Islamiyya, or Islamic culture and the importance of avoiding non-Islamic cultural practices and non-Muslim friendship no matter how innocent these may appear, on the grounds that the Sunnah forbids imitating non-Muslims. Foreign practices sometimes punished and sometimes simply condemned by Wahhabi preachers as unislamic, include celebrating foreign days such as Valentine's Day, or Mother's Day shaving, cutting or trimming of beards, giving of flowers, standing up in honor of someone, celebrating birthdays including the prophets, keeping or petting dogs. 
Wahhabi scholars have warned against taking non Muslims as friends, smiling at or wishing them well on their holidays. Wahhabis are not in unanimous agreement on what is forbidden as sin. Some Wahhabi preachers or activists go further than the official Saudi Arabian Council of Senior Scholars in forbidding what they believe to be sin. Several Wahhabis have declared football forbidden for a variety of reasons including it is a non-Muslim, foreign practice, because of the revealing uniforms and because of the foreign non-Muslim language used in matches. The Saudi Grand Mufti, on the other hand has declared football permissible halal. Senior Wahhabi leaders in Saudi Arabia have determined that Islam forbids the traveling or working outside the home by a woman without their husband's permission, permission which may be revoked at any time, on the grounds that the different physiological structures and biological functions of the two sexes mean that each is assigned a distinctive role to play in the family. As mentioned before, Wahhabism also forbids the driving of motor vehicles by women. Sexual intercourse out of wedlock may be punished with beheading, although sex out of wedlock was permissible with a female slave until the practice of slavery was banned in 1962 Prince Bundar bin Sultan was the product of a brief encounter between his father Prince Sultan bin Abdul Aziz, the Saudi defense minister for many years, and his slave, a black-serving woman. Despite this strictness, senior Wahhabi scholars of Islam in the Saudi kingdom have made exceptions in ruling on what is haram. Foreign non-Muslim troops are forbidden in Arabia, except when the king needed them to confront Saddam Hussein in 1990, gender mixing of men and women is forbidden, and fraternization with non-Muslims is discouraged, but not at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology cost. Movie theaters and driving by women are forbidden, except at the Aramco compound in eastern Saudi, populated by workers for the company that provides almost all the government's revenue. The exceptions made at cost are also in effect at Aramco. More general rules of what is permissible have changed over time. Abdul Aziz ibn Saud imposed Wahhabi doctrines and practices in a progressively gentler form. As his early 20th century conquests expanded his state into urban areas, especially the Hijab. After vigorous debate Wahhabi religious authorities in Saudi Arabia allowed the use of paper money in 1951, the abolition of slavery in 1962, education of females 1964, and use of television 1965. Music, the sound of which once might have led to summary execution, is now commonly heard on Saudi radios. Minarets for mosques and use of funeral markers, which were once forbidden, are now allowed. Prayer attendance which was once enforced by flogging, is no longer. Appearance The uniformity of dress among men and women in Saudi Arabia compared to other Muslim countries in the Middle East has been called a striking example of Wahhabism's outward influence on Saudi society, and an example of the Wahhabi belief that Outward appearances and expressions are directly connected to one's inward state. The long, white flowing thobe worn by men of Saudi Arabia has been called the Wahhabi national dress. Red and white checkered or white head scarves known as gutra are worn. In public women are required to wear a black abaya or other black clothing that covers every part of their body other than hands and eyes. A. Badge of a particularly pious Salafi or Wahhabi man is a robe too short to cover the ankle, an untrimmed beard, and no cord agal to hold the head scarf in place. The warriors of the Ikhwan Wahhabi religious militia wore a white turban in place of an agal. Wahhabi <laughs> <laughs> mission Wahhabi mission, or Dawa Wahhabiya, is the idea of spreading Wahhabism throughout the world. Tens of billions of dollars have been spent by the Saudi government and charities on mosques, schools, education materials, scholarships, throughout the world to promote Islam and the Wahhabi interpretation of it. Tens of thousands of volunteers and several billion dollars also went in support of the jihad against the atheist communist regime governing Afghanistan. Topic. Regions Wahhabism originated in the Najd region, and its conservative practices have stronger support there than in regions in the kingdom to the east or west of it. Glass credits the softening of some Wahhabi doctrines and practices on the conquest of the Hejaz region. 
with its more cosmopolitan traditions and the traffic of pilgrims which the new rulers could not afford to alienate. The only other country whose native population is Wahhabi and that adheres to the Wahhabi creed is the small Gulf monarchy of Qatar, whose version of Wahhabism is notably less strict. Unlike Saudi Arabia, Qatar made significant changes in the 1990s. Women are now allowed to drive and travel independently, non-Muslims are permitted to consume alcohol and pork. The country sponsors a film festival, has world-class art museums, hosts Al Jazeera News Service, will hold the 2022 Football World Cup, and has no religious force that polices public morality. Qataris attribute its different interpretation of Islam to the absence of an indigenous clerical class and autonomous bureaucracy religious affairs authority, endowments, grand mufti, the fact that Qatari rulers do not derive their legitimacy from such a class. Views <laughs> 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 Adherents to the Wahhabi movement identify as Sunni Muslims. The primary Wahhabi doctrine is affirmation of the uniqueness and unity of God tawhid, and opposition to shirk violation of tawhid, the one unforgivable sin, according to Ibn Abd al-Wahhab. They call for adherence to the beliefs and practices of the Salaf exemplary early Muslims. They strongly oppose what they consider to be heterodox doctrines, particularly those held by the vast majority of Sunnis and Shiites, and practices such as the veneration of prophets and saints in the Islamic tradition. They emphasize reliance on the literal meaning of the Quran and Hadith, rejecting rationalistic theology Kalam. Wahhabism has been associated with the practice of takfir labeling Muslims who disagree with their doctrines as apostates. Adherents of Wahhabism are favorable to derivation of new legal rulings so long as it is true to the essence of the Quran, Sunnah and understanding of the Salaf. Theology In theology Wahhabism is closely aligned with the Athari literal school, which represents the prevalent theological position of the Hanbali school of law. Athari theology is characterized by reliance on the zahir apparent or literal meaning of the Quran and Hadith, and opposition to the rational argumentation in matters of belief favored by Ash'ari and Maturidi theology. However, Wahhabism diverges in some points of theology from other Athari movements. These include a zealous tendency toward takfir, which bears a resemblance to the Karajits. Another distinctive feature is a strong opposition to mysticism. Although it is typically attributed to the influence of Ibn Taymiyyah, Jeffrey Halverson argues that Ibn Taymiyyah only opposed what he saw as Sufi excesses and never mysticism in itself, being himself a member of the Qadiriya Sufi order. DeLong Ba writes that Ibn Abd al-Wahhab did not denounce Sufism or Sufis as a group, but rather attacked specific practices which he saw as inconsistent with the Quran and Hadith. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab considered some beliefs and practices of the Shia to violate the doctrine of monotheism. According to DeLong Ba, in his polemic against the extremist Rafida sect of Shis, he criticized them for assigning greater authority to their current leaders than to Muhammad in interpreting the Quran and Sharia, and for denying the validity of the consensus of the early Muslim community. He also believed that the Shia doctrine of infallibility of the Imams constituted associationism with God. David Commons describes the pivotal idea in Ibn Abd al Wahhab's teaching as being that. Muslims who disagreed with his definition of monotheism were not misguided Muslims, but outside the pale of Islam altogether." This put Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's teaching at odds with that of most Muslims through history who believed that the shahada profession of faith, there is no God but God, Muhammad is his messenger made one a Muslim, and that shortcomings in that person's behavior and performance of other obligatory rituals rendered them a sinner but, not an unbeliever. Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab did not accept that view. He argued that the criterion for one's standing as either a Muslim or an unbeliever was correct worship as an expression of belief in one God. Any act or statement that indicates devotion to a being other than God is to associate another creature with God's power, and that is tantamount to idolatry shirk. Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab included in the category of such acts popular religious practices that made holy men into intercessors with God. 
That was the core of the controversy between him and his adversaries, including his own brother. In Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's major work, a small book called Kitab al-Tahid, he states that worship in Islam is limited to conventional acts of worship such as the five daily prayers salat, fasting for Ramadan salm, dua supplication, istiyada seeking protection or refuge, istana seeking help, and istigatha to Allah seeking benefits and calling upon Allah alone. Worship beyond this, making dua or tawassal, are acts of shirk and in violation of the tenets of tawhid monotheism. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's justification for considering the majority of Muslims of Arabia to be unbelievers, and for waging war on them, can be summed up as his belief that the original pagans the Prophet Muhammad fought, "...affirmed that God is the creator, the sustainer and the master of all affairs, they gave alms, they performed pilgrimage and they avoided forbidden things from fear of God." What made them pagans whose blood could be shed and wealth plundered was that, "...they sacrificed animals to other beings, they sought the help of other beings, they swore vows by other beings." Someone who does such things even if their lives are otherwise exemplary is not a Muslim but an unbeliever as Ibn Abd al-Wahhab believed. Once such people have received the call to, "...true Islam." understood it and then rejected it, their blood and treasure are forfeit. This disagreement between Wahhabis and non-Wahhabi Muslims over the definition of worship and monotheism has remained much the same since 1740, according to David Commons, although, according to Saudi writer and religious television show host Abdul Aziz Qasim, as of 2014, there are changes happening within the Wahhabi doctrine and among its followers. According to another source, defining aspects of Wahhabism include a very literal interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah and a tendency to reinforce local practices of the Najd, whether the teachings of Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab included the need for social renewal and plans for socio-religious reform of society in the Arabian Peninsula, rather than simply a return to ritual correctness and moral purity, is disputed. Topic. Jurisprudence Thick. Of the four major sources in Sunni fiqh, the Quran, the Sunnah, Consensus IJMA, and Analogical Reasoning Qiyas, Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's writings emphasized the Quran and Sunnah. He used IJMA only, in conjunction with its corroboration of the Quran and Hadith, and giving preference to the IJMA of Muhammad's companions rather than the IJMA of legal specialists after his time, and Qiyas only in cases of extreme necessity. He rejected deference to past juridical opinion in favor of independent reasoning and opposed using local customs. He urged his followers to "...return to the primary sources of Islam in order to determine how the Quran and Muhammad dealt with specific situations." when using ijihad. According to Edward Mortimer, it was imitation of past juridical opinion in the face of clear contradictory evidence from hadith or Quranic text that Ibn Abd al-Wahhab condemned. Natana de Long Ba writes that the Wahhabi tendency to consider failure to abide by Islamic law as equivalent to apostasy was based on the ideology of Ibn Taymiyyah rather than Ibn Abd al Wahhab's preaching and emerged after the latter's death. According to an expert on law in Saudi Arabia, Frank Vogel, Ibn Abd al Wahhab himself produced no unprecedented opinions. The Wahhabis's bitter differences with other Muslims were not over fiqh rules at all, but over aqidah, or theological positions." Scholar David Cummings also states that early disputes with other Muslims did not center on fiqh, and that the belief that the distinctive character of Wahhabism stems from Hanbali legal thought is a myth. Some scholars are ambivalent as to whether Wahhabis belong to the Hanbali legal school. The Encyclopedia of Islam and the Muslim World maintains Wahhabis rejected all jurisprudence that in their opinion did not adhere strictly to the letter of the Quran and the Hadith." Cyril Glass's New Encyclopedia of Islam states that, "...strictly speaking, Wahhabis do not see themselves as belonging to any school," and that in doing so they correspond to the ideal aimed at by Ibn Hanbal, and thus they can be said to be of his school. According to DeLong Ba, Ibn Abd al-Wahhab never directly claimed to be a Hanbali jurist, warned his followers about the dangers of adhering unquestionably to fiqh, and did not consider the opinion of any law school to be binding. 
He did, however, follow the Hanbali methodology of judging everything not explicitly forbidden to be permissible, avoiding the use of analogical reasoning, and taking public interest and justice into consideration. Loyalty and disassociation According to various sources scholars, former Saudi students, Arabic speaking, reading teachers who have had access to Saudi text books, and journalists, Ibn Abd al Wahhab and his successors preach that theirs is the one true form of Islam. According to a doctrine known as al Wala wa al Bara literally, loyalty and disassociation. Abd al-Wahhab argued that it was "...imperative for Muslims not to befriend, ally themselves with, or imitate non-Muslims or heretical Muslims," and that this "...enmity and hostility of Muslims toward non-Muslims and heretical had to be visible and unequivocal." Even as late as 2003, entire pages in Saudi textbooks were devoted to explaining to undergraduates that all forms of Islam except Wahhabism were deviation, although, according to one source Hamid Algar, Wahhabis have discreetly concealed this view from other Muslims outside Saudi Arabia. Over the years, in reply, the Saudi Arabian government has strenuously denied the above allegations including that their government exports religious or cultural extremism or supports extremist religious education. Politics According to Ibn Abdal Wahhab there are three objectives for Islamic government and society. To believe in Allah, enjoin good behavior, and forbid wrongdoing. This doctrine has been sustained in missionary literature, sermons, fatwa rulings, and explications of religious doctrine by Wahhabis since the death of Ibn Abdul Wahhab. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab saw a role for the Imam, responsible for religious matters, and the Emir, in charge of political and military issues. In Saudi history the Imam has not been a religious preacher or scholar, but Muhammad ibn Saud and subsequent Saudi rulers. He also taught that the Muslim ruler is owed unquestioned allegiance as a religious obligation from his people so long as he leads the community according to the laws of God. A Muslim must present a bayah, or oath of allegiance, to a Muslim ruler during his lifetime to ensure his redemption after death. Any counsel given to a ruler from community leaders or ulama should be private, not through public acts such as petitions, demonstrations, etc. This strict obedience can become problematic if a dynastic dispute arises and someone rebelling against the ruler succeeds and becomes the ruler, as happened in the late 19th century at the end of the second Al Saud state. Is the successful rebel a ruler to be obeyed, or a usurper? While this gives the king wide power, respecting sharia does impose limits, such as giving qadi Islamic judges independence. This means not interfering in their deliberations, but also not codifying laws, following precedents or establishing a uniform system of law courts, both of which violate the Qadi's independence. Wahhabis have traditionally given their allegiance to the House of Saud, but a movement of Salafi jihadis has developed among those who believe Al Saud has abandoned the laws of God. According to Zubair Kumar, while the standard view is that Wahhabis are apolitical and do not oppose the state, there is another strain of Wahhabism that found prominence among a group of Wahhabis after the fall of the second Saudi state in the 1800s, and post 9-11 is associated with Jordanian, Palestinian scholar Abu Muhammad al-Makdisi and Wahhabi scholars of the Shu'aibi school. Wahhabis share the belief of Islamists such as the Muslim Brotherhood in Islamic dominion over politics and government and the importance of dawa proselytizing or preaching of Islam not just towards non-Muslims but towards erring Muslims. However Wahhabi preachers are conservative and do not deal with concepts such as social justice, anticolonialism, or economic equality, expounded upon by Islamist Muslims. Ibn Abdul Wahhab's original pact promised whoever championed his message, will, by means of it, rule and lands and men. <inaudible> Population One of the more detailed estimates of religious population in the Persian Gulf is by Merdad Izadi who estimates 
using cultural and not confessional criteria. Approximately 4.56 million Wahhabis in the Persian Gulf region, about 4 million from Saudi Arabia, mostly the Najd, and the rest coming overwhelmingly from the Emirates and Qatar. Most Sunni Qataris are Wahhabis 46.9% of all Qataris and 44.8% of Emiratis are Wahhabis, 5.7% of Bahrainis are Wahhabis, and 2.2% of Kuwaitis are Wahhabis. Notable leaders There has traditionally been a recognized head of the Wahhabi religious estate, often a member of al-Ash Sheikh a descendant of Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab or related to another religious head. For example, Abd al-Latif was the son of Abd al-Rahman ibn Hassan. Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab was the founder of the Wahhabi movement. Abd Allah ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab was the head of Wahhabism after his father retired from public life in 1773. After the fall of the first Saudi emirate, Abd Allah went into exile in Cairo where he died. Sulayman ibn Abd Allah was a grandson of Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab and author of an influential treatise that restricted travel to and residing in land of idolaters i.e. land outside of the Wahhabi area. Abd al-Rahman ibn Hassan was head of the religious estate in the Second Saudi Emirate. Abd al-Latif ibn Abd al-Rahman head of religious estate in 1860 and early 1870s. Abd Allah ibn Abd al-Latif al-Ash Sheikh was the head of religious estate during period of Rashidi rule and the early years of King Abd al-Aziz ibn Saud. Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Ash Sheikh was the head of Wahhabism in mid-20th century. He has been said to have dominated the Wahhabi religious estate and enjoyed unrivaled religious authority. Ghalia al Wahhabiyya was a female military leader who defended Mecca against recapture by Ottoman forces. In more recent times, two Wahhabi clerics have risen to prominence with no relation to Ibn Abd al Wahhab. Abdul Aziz bin Baz has been called the most prominent proponent of Wahhabism during his time. Muhammad ibn al Uthaymeen is another giant. According to David Dean Commons, no one has emerged with the same degree of authority in the Saudi religious establishment since their deaths. <laughs> <laughs> International influence and propagation Topic. Explanation for influence Khalid Abu Lfadl attributed the appeal of Wahhabism to some Muslims as stemming from Arab nationalism, which followed the Wahhabi attack on the Ottoman Empire Reformism, which followed a return to Salaf as Salaf as Salah Destruction of the Hejaz Khilafah in 1925 Control of Mecca and Medina, which gave Wahhabis great influence on Muslim culture and thinking Oil, which after 1975 allowed Wahhabis to promote their interpretations of Islam using billions from oil export revenue. Scholar Giles Keppel, agrees that the tripling in the price of oil in the mid-1970s and the progressive takeover of Saudi Aramco in the 1974-1980 period, provided the source of much influence of Wahhabism in the Islamic world. The financial clout of Saudi Arabia had been amply demonstrated during the oil embargo against the United States, following the Arab-Israeli War of 1973. This show of international power, along with the nation's astronomical increase in wealth, allowed Saudi Arabia's puritanical, conservative Wahhabite faction to attain a preeminent position of strength in the global expression of Islam. Saudi Arabia's impact on Muslims throughout the world was less visible than that of Khomeini s Iran, but the effect was deeper and more enduring. It reorganized the religious landscape by promoting those associations and ulamas who followed its lead, and then, by injecting substantial amounts of money into Islamic interests of all sorts, it won over many more converts. 
Above all, the Saudis raised a new standard, the virtuous Islamic civilization, as foil for the corrupting influence of the West. Funding factor Estimates of Saudi spending on religious causes abroad include, "...upward of $100 billion", between $2 and $3 billion per year since 1975 compared to the annual Soviet propaganda budget of $1 billion per year, and, "...at least $87 billion", from 1987 to 2007, its largesse funded an estimated 90% of the expenses of the entire faith throughout the Muslim world, according to journalist Dawood al Shirian. It extended to young and old, from children's madrasas to high level scholarship, books, scholarships, fellowships, mosques. For example, more than 1,500 mosques were built from Saudi public funds over the last 50 years, were paid for. It rewarded journalists and academics, who followed it and built satellite campuses around Egypt for Al-Azhar, the oldest and most influential Islamic university. Yahya Burt counts spending on 1,500 mosques, 210 Islamic centers and dozens of Muslim academies and schools. This financial aid has done much to overwhelm less strict local interpretations of Islam, according to observers like Dawood al Shirian and Lee Kuan Yew, and has caused the Saudi interpretation, sometimes called Petro Islam, to be perceived as the correct interpretation or the gold standard of Islam in many Muslims' minds. <laughs> Militant and political Islam According to counter-terrorism scholar Thomas F. Lynch III, Sunni extremists perpetrated about 700 terror attacks killing roughly 7,000 people from 1981 to 2006. What connection, if any, there is between Wahhabism and the jihadi Salafis such as Al-Qaeda who carried out these attacks, is disputed. Natana de Long Ba, senior research assistant at the Prince Alwaleed Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University, argues, the militant Islam of Osama bin Laden did not have its origins in the teachings of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab and was not representative of Wahhabi Islam as it is practiced in contemporary Saudi Arabia, yet for the media it came to define Wahhabi Islam during the later years of bin Laden's lifetime. However, unrepresentative bin Laden's global jihad was of Islam in general and Wahhabi Islam in particular, its prominence in headline news took Wahhabi Islam across the spectrum from revival and reform to global jihad. Noah Feldman distinguishes between what he calls the deeply conservative Wahhabis and what he calls the followers of political Islam in the 1980s and 1990s, such as Egyptian Islamic Jihad and later Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawari. While Saudi Wahhabis were the largest funders of local Muslim Brotherhood chapters and other hardline Islamists, during this time, they opposed jihadi resistance to Muslim governments and assassination of Muslim leaders because of their belief that the decision to wage jihad lay with the ruler, not the individual believer. Karen Armstrong states that Osama bin Laden, like most extremists, followed the ideology of Sayyid Qutb, not Wahhabism. More recently the self-declared Islamic State in Iraq and Syria headed by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has been described as both more violent than al-Qaeda and more closely aligned with Wahhabism. For their guiding principles, the leaders of the Islamic State, also known as ISIS or ISIL, are open and clear about their almost exclusive commitment to the Wahhabi movement of Sunni Islam. The group circulates images of Wahhabi religious textbooks from Saudi Arabia in the schools it controls. Videos from the group's territory have shown Wahhabi texts plastered on the sides of an official missionary van. According to scholar Bernard Heichel, "...for Al-Qaeda, violence is a means to an end, for ISIS, it is an end in itself." Wahhabism is the Islamic State's "...closest religious cognate." The Sunni militant groups worldwide that are associated with the Wahhabi ideology include, Al-Shabaab, Ansar Dine, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and ISIS. Criticism and controversy <laughs> 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 
Criticism by other Muslims Among the criticism, or comments made by critics, of the Wahhabi movement are that it is not so much strict and uncompromising as aberrant, going beyond the bounds of Islam in its restricted definition of tawhid monotheism, and much too willing to commit takfir declare non-Muslim and subject to execution Muslims it found in violation of the doctrines of Wahhabism. In the second Wahhabi Saudi Jihad, conquest of the Arabian Peninsula, an estimated 400,000 were killed or wounded according to some estimates, that bin Saud's agreement to wage jihad to spread Ibn Abdul Wahhab's teachings had more to do with traditional NAJ JD practice of raiding, instinctive fight for survival and appetite for lucre, than with religion, that it has no connection to other Islamic revival movements, that unlike other revivalists, its founder Abd al Wahhab showed little scholarship, writing little and making even less commentary, that its rejection of the orthodox belief in saints, which had become a cardinal doctrine in Sunni Islam very early on, represents a departure from something which has been an integral part of Islam for over a millennium. In this connection, mainstream Sunni scholars also critique the Wahhabi citing of Ibn Taymiyyah as an authority when Ibn Taymiyyah himself adhered to the belief in the existence of saints, that its contention towards visiting the tombs and shrines of prophets and saints and the seeking of their intercession, violate Tawheed al abada directing all worship to God alone has no basis in tradition, in consensus or in hadith, and that even if it did, it would not be grounds for excluding practitioners of ziyara and tawassal from Islam, that its use of Ibn Hanbal, Ibn al-Qayyim, and even Ibn Taymiyyah's name to support its stance is inappropriate, as it is historically known that all three of these men revered many aspects of Sufism, save that the latter two critiqued certain practices among the Sufis of their time. Those who criticize this aspect of Wahhabism often refer to the group's use of Ibn Hanbal's name to be a particularly egregious error, arguing that the jurist's love for the relics of Muhammad, for the intercession of the Prophet, and for the Sufis of his time is well established in Islamic tradition. That historically Wahhabis have had a suspicious willingness to ally itself with non-Muslim powers specifically America and Britain, and in particular to ignore the encroachments into Muslim territory of a non-Muslim imperial power the British while waging jihad and weakening the Muslim caliphate of the Ottomans. <laughs> <laughs> Initial opposition The first people to oppose Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab were his father Abd al-Wahhab and his brother Salman ibn Abd al-Wahhab who was an Islamic scholar and Qadi. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's brother wrote a book in refutation of his brother's new teachings, called, The Final Word from the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sayings of the Scholars Concerning the School of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab, also known as Al Sawa backquote IQ al Ilahiya fi Madhab al Wahhabiya, the divine thunderbolts concerning the Wahhabi school, in the refutation of Wahhabism in Arabic sources, 1745 to 1932. Hamadi Ridasi provides original references to the description of Wahhabis as a divisive sect, firka, and outliers, karajits, in communications between Ottomans and Egyptian Khedive Muhammad Ali. Ridasi details refutations of Wahhabis by scholars muftis, among them Ahmed Barakat Tandadawin, who in 1743 describes Wahhabism as ignorance <laughs> <laughs> Shia opposition In 1801 and 1802, the Saudi Wahhabis under Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud attacked and captured the holy Shia cities of Karbala and Najaf in Iraq and destroyed the tombs of Husayn ibn Ali, who is the grandson of Muhammad, and Ali, Ali bin Abu Talib, the son-in-law of Muhammad see, Saudi sponsorship mentioned previously. In 1803 and 1804 the Saudis captured Mecca and Madinah and demolished various tombs of all al bayt and Sahaba, ancient monuments, ruins according to Wahhabis, they "...removed a number of what were seen as sources or possible gateways to polytheism or shirk," such as the tomb of Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. 
In 1998 the Saudis bulldozed and poured petroleum over the grave of Amina bint Wahb, the mother of Muhammad, causing resentment throughout the Muslim world. Shia Muslims complain that Wahhabis and their teachings are a driving force behind sectarian violence and anti-Shia targeted killings in many countries such as Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bahrain, Yemen. Worldwide, Saudis run sponsored mosques and Islamic schools teaching the Wahhabi version of Sunni Islam that labels Shia Muslims, Sufis, Christians, Jews and others as either apostates or infidels, thus paving a way for armed jihad against them by any means necessary till their death or submission to the Wahhabi doctrine. Wahhabis consider Shiites to be the archenemies of Islam. Topic: <laughs> Sunni opposition. Egypt Wahhabism has been vehemently criticized by many mainstream Sunni Muslims and continues to be condemned by many prominent traditional Sunni scholars for being a «heretical and violent» innovation within Sunni Islam. Among traditional Sunni organizations worldwide that oppose the Wahhabi ideology is the Al-Azhar in Cairo, the faculty of which regularly denounces Wahhabism with terms such as «satanic faith». Regarding Wahhabism, the renowned Azharite Sunni scholar and intellectual Muhammad Abu Zara said, "...the Wahhabis exaggerated and bowdlerized Ibn Taymiyyah's positions. The Wahhabis did not restrain themselves to proselytism only, but resorted to warmongering against whoever disagreed with them on the grounds that they were fighting innovation and innovations are an evil that must be fought." Whenever they were able to seize a town or city they would come to the tombs and turn them into ruins and destruction and they would destroy whatever mosques were with the tombs also. Their brutality did not stop there but they also came to whatever graves were visible and destroyed them also. And when the ruler of the Hiyas regions caved into them they destroyed all the graves of the companions and razed them to the ground. In fact, it has been noticed that the ulama of the Wahhabis consider their own opinions correct and not possibly wrong, while they consider the opinions of others wrong and not possibly correct. More than that, they consider what others than themselves do in the way of erecting tombs and circumambulating them, as near to idolatry. In this respect they are near the Kaware who used to declare those who dissented with them apostate and fight them as we already mentioned. The Sunni conventional scholars for centuries rejected Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas, however, Wahhabism has made this controversial scholar its central figure. In the 18th century, the Hanafi scholar Ibn Abidin declared the Wahhabi movement of Muhammad ibn Abd al Wahhab to be a modern day manifestation of the Karajits. Another important early rebuttal of Wahhabism came from the Sunni jurist Ibn Jurgis, who argued that supplicating the saints is permitted to whoever declares that there is no God but God and prays toward Mecca. For, according to him, supplicating the saints is not a form of worship but merely calling out to them, and that worship at graves is not idolatry unless the supplicant believes that buried saints have the power to determine the course of events. These arguments were specifically rejected as heretical by the Wahhabi leader at the time. <laughs> Morocco the influential Sunni jurist and son of the renowned Moroccan scholar Abdullah al-Ghumari, Abul Fayd Ahmad, staunchly condemned Wahhabism and attacked it for straying away from classical tradition, stating, and nothing has emerged to bring about earthquakes and discord in the religion like Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, who was astray and led others astray. Hence he was the devil's horn foretold by the messenger, upon him be blessings and peace, and he abstained from offering prayer for Najd because of him, and because of the dissensions which would flow from his demonic preaching. <laughs> Kuwait the prominent Kuwaiti Sunni Shafi'i jurist Yusuf ibn al Said Hashim al Rifa I remained a severe critic of Wahhabism throughout his scholarly life, and penned a famous 57 point critique of the movement, titled Advice to the Scholars of Najd. He criticized the followers of the movement for causing discord among the Sunni community by their labeling all other Sunnis as pagans, innovators, and deviants. 
Topic: Turkey. The transnational Turkish Gulen movement disagrees with Wahhabism furthermore blames it directly for the rise of Islamophobia in the world. The leader of the movement Fethullah Gulen denounces Arabs for conspiring against the Ottoman state as well as interpreting Islam strictly by their Arabian culture and Wahhabism. Indonesia <inaudible> 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 The largest Sunni organization in the world, Indonesia's Nadlatul Ulama, opposes Wahhabism, referring to as a fanatical and innovative movement within the tradition of Sunnism. Subsequently, Nadlatul Ulama promotes Islam Nusantara, as an alternative movement against the growing austerity, intolerance, radicalization and violence brought by Wahhabi movement within modern Indonesian society. Islam Nusantara was developed in Nusantara Indonesian archipelago at least since the 16th century, defined as an interpretation of Islam that takes into account local Indonesian customs in forming its fiqh. <laughs> Malaysia Malaysia's largest Islamic body, the National Fatwa Council, has described Wahhabism as being against Sunni teachings. Dr. Abdul Shukur Hussain, chairman of the National Fatwa Council, said Wahhabi followers were fond of declaring Muslims of other schools as apostates merely on the grounds that they did not conform to Wahhabi teachings. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> India. South Asia's Barelvi movement rejects Wahhabi beliefs. According to Barelvi scholars, Wahhabis preach violence as opposed to Barelvis who promote peace. In 2016 Barelvis banned Wahhabis from their mosques nationwide. The founder of the movement Ahmed Raza Khan said Wahhabis aren't Muslims, and any Muslim who has difficulty understanding this, has also left Islam. Somalia. The Somalia-based paramilitary group Alu Sunna Waljama'a actively battles Wahhabi militants to prevent imposition of Wahhabi ideology. <inaudible> <inaudible> Lebanon The transnational Lebanon al-Abash movement uses takfir against Wahhabi and Salafi leaders. The head of al-Abash, Abdullah al-Harari says Wahhabis offer anthropomorphic descriptions of God thereby imitate polytheists. <laughs> United States the Sufi Islamic Supreme Council of America founded by the Naqshbandi Sufi Sheikh Hisham Kabani classify Wahhabism as being extremist and heretical based on Wahhabism's role as a terrorist ideology and labeling of other Muslims, especially Sufis as polytheists, a practice known as takfir. In general, mainstream Sunni Muslims condemn Wahhabism for being a major factor behind the rise of such groups as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Boko Haram, while also inspiring movements such as the Taliban. Topic: 2016 Joint Fatwa in Chechnya. In late 2016, at a conference of over a hundred Sunni scholars in Chechnya, Al Azhar's current dean, Ahmed El Tayeb, was said to have taken an uncompromising stand against Wahhabism and Islamic terrorism by defining Orthodox Sunnism as the Asharites and Muturidis adherents of the theological systems of Imam Abu Mansur al maturidi and Imam Abul Hasan al Ashari. Followers of any of the four schools of thought Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki or Hanbali and also the followers of the Sufism of Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi in doctrines, manners and spiritual purification." Having said that, Sheikh Ahmad al-Tayeb excluded the Salafists from the term of Alul Sunnah Sunnis, stating that Salafists, also known as Wahhabis, are not from among the Sunnis. Non-religious motivations According to at least one critic, the 1744–1745 alliance between Ibn Abdul Wahhab and the tribal chief Muhammad bin Saud to wage jihad on neighboring allegedly false Muslims, was a «consecration» by Ibn Abdul Wahhab of bin Saud tribe's long-standing raids on neighboring oases by «renaming those raids jihad» part of the Najdis. 
Habesian state of perpetual war pitted Bedouin tribes against one another for control of the scarce resources that could stave off starvation, and a case of substituting fath, the opening or conquest of a vast territory through religious zeal, for the instinctive fight for survival and appetite for lucre. Topic Wahhabism in the United States A study conducted by the NGO Freedom House found Wahhabi publications in mosques in the United States. These publications included statements that Muslims should not only always oppose infidels in every way, but hate them for their religion, for Allah's sake, that democracy is responsible for all the horrible wars, and the number of wars it started in the 20th century alone is more than 130 wars, and that Shia and certain Sunni Muslims were infidels. A review of the study by the Muslim Brotherhood Affiliated Institute for Social Policy and Understanding (ISPU) complained that the study cited documents from only a few mosques, arguing that most mosques in the U.S. are not under Wahhabi influence. ISPU comments on the study were not entirely negative. American Muslim leaders must thoroughly scrutinize this study. Despite its limitations, the study highlights an ugly undercurrent in modern Islamic discourse that American Muslims must openly confront. However, in the vigor to expose strains of extremism, we must not forget that open discussion is the best tool to debunk the extremist literature rather than a suppression of First Amendment rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Concern has been expressed over the fact that U.S. university branches, like the Georgetown School of Foreign Service and the Northwestern School of Journalism, housed in the Wahhabi country of Qatar, are exposed to the extremist propaganda espoused by Wahhabist imams who preach at the Qatar Foundation's mosque in Education City. Education City, a large campus where U.S. and European universities reside, hosted a series of religious prayers and lectures as part of a month-long annual Ramadan program in 2015. The prayers and lectures were held at Education City's new lavish mosque in Doha. Education City also affords campus space to other American universities such as Texas A&M and Carnegie Mellon. Among those who have attended Education City lectures is a Saudi preacher who described the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris as the sequel to the comedy film of 9 11 and another cleric who wrote, Jews and their helpers must be destroyed. The mosque in Education City has hosted extremist anti Semitic Wahhabi preachers speaking against Zionist aggressors in their sermons, and calling upon Allah to count them in number and kill them completely, do not spare a single one of them. Qatar has reportedly sent Jewish professors back to America, and students attending America. American universities in Qatar are reportedly required to dress in a manner respectful to Wahhabism. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> European expansion. There has been much concern expressed in both American and European media and scholarship over the fact that Wahhabi countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been financing mosques and buying up land all over Europe. Belgium, Ireland, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Italy have all noted the growing influence that these Wahhabi countries have over territory and religion in Europe. The concern resonates at a local level in Europe as well. In 2016, the citizens of Brussels, Belgium overturned a 2015 decision to build a 600 person mosque next to the Qatari embassy. Fear largely emanates from the fact that Belgian citizens see the mosque as an opportunity for a Wahhabi country to exert control over Muslims in Europe, thus spreading the more extreme sect of Islam. Several articles have been written that list the Cork Islamic Cultural Centre as an example of one of many properties throughout Europe, paid for by the Qatari government, in an effort to spread an extreme and intolerant form of Islam known as Wahhabism. The Asalam Mosque is located in Nantes. France was also a source on some controversy. Construction on the mosque began in 2009 and was completed in 2012. It is the largest mosque in its region in France. The mosque is frequently listed among examples of Qatar's efforts to export Wahhabism, their extreme and often intolerant version of Islam. Throughout Europe, some of the initiatives of the Cultural Islamic Centre Sesto San Giovanni in Italy, funded by Qatar Charity, have also raised concerns due to its ties to Wahhabism. The Consortium Against Terrorist Finance CATF said that the mosque has a history of affiliation and cooperation with extremists and terrorists. CATF notes that Qatar Charity was named as a major financial conduit for al-Qaeda in judicial proceedings following the attacks on the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, supported al-Qaeda operatives in northern Mali, and was heavily involved in Syria. 
Munich Forum for Islam MFI, also known as the Center for Islam in Europe Munich Zim, was another controversial initiative largely financed by the Wahhabi Gulf country of Qatar. In 2013 German activists filed a lawsuit in opposition to the construction of the mosque. These activists expressed fear that the Qatari government aimed to build mosques all over Europe to spread Wahhabism. But the government quashed the lawsuit. In addition to this 2014 ruling, another court ordered an anti-mosque protester to pay a fine for defaming Islam when the protester claimed that Wahhabi Islam is incompatible with democracy. The Islamic Cultural Center in Luxembourg was also funded by Qatar in what some note as an attempt by Qatar to spread Wahhabism in Europe. Topic: <laughs> Destruction of Islam's early historical sites. The Wahhabi teachings disapprove of veneration of the historical sites associated with early Islam, on the grounds that only God should be worshipped, and that veneration of sites associated with mortals leads to idolatry. However, critics point out that no Muslims venerate buildings or tombs as it is a shirk. Muslims visiting the resting places of Al Al Bayt or Sahaba still pray to Allah alone while remembering the Prophet's companions and family members. Many buildings associated with early Islam, including mazar, mausoleums and other artifacts have been destroyed in Saudi Arabia by Wahhabis from the early 19th century through the present day. This practice has proved controversial and has received considerable criticism from Sufi and Shia Muslims and in the non-Muslim world. Ironically, despite Wahhabi destruction of many Islamic, non-Islamic, and historical sites associated with the first Muslims, the Prophet's family and companions, and the strict prohibition of visiting such sites, including mosques, the Saudi government renovated the tomb of Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, turning his birthplace into a major tourist attraction and an important place of visitation within the kingdom's modern borders. Topic. See also Decline and modernization of the Ottoman Empire International propagation of Salafism and Wahhabism Islamic fundamentalism Islamic schools and branches Muslim World League Ottoman-Saudi War Petro-Islam Sufi-Salafi relations Takfiriz Wahhabi Islam, from revival and reform to global jihad Memoirs of Mr. Hempfer, the British spy to the Middle East